Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to tutorial three of this uh, uh, intellectual property modules that we have been having. Uh, today is the 10th day of September 2020 and uh, to commence our session this afternoon, uh, we will begin with the national anthem in Kiswahili. I will recite it. E mungu nguvu yetu Ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwengao na mlinzi, natukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for this uh, particular session, tutorial number three, we will be taken through by uh, Mr. William Agan. Uh, William Agan is an advocate and IP consultant. He is a member of the Faculty of Law at the Catholic University of East Africa. His specialization is uh, intellectual property. He is a registered uh, patent agent with uh, KIPI. He is a certified professional mediator and he runs the firm Agan and Associates. Uh, in addition, he is a, le a guest lecturer in IP at the Kenya School of law. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for this uh, particular third uh, session, we will be looking at uh, the areas of uh, unfair competition and developmental issues, as well as having a recap and uh, uh, quite sufficient time for questions and answers. I encourage you to be able to put in your questions and answers uh, in the chat facility and we will be able to look at them uh, towards the end of the series. Uh, to set us going, uh, we have a young mediator, uh, Mohammed Said. Mohammed Said will be able to give us a, a commentary. Uh, Mohammed Said, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Great to have you with us, Mohammed. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very okay. much. Please proceed with your commentary. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Moderator Sala, and also would like to welcome again William Agan. Uh, we have benefited a lot from his presentation, and uh, especially when you are looking at intellectual property as a mechanism for development. As you understand that uh, every individual person needs motivation to think and innovate. Innovation and thinking needs takes a lot of energies take someone's mind. So someone needs encouragement that when he innovates, he will be the owner of that innovation. And that's what intellectual property does. It protects that energy, that effort that someone has, has, uh, has done so that, hello, am I clear, please? Yes, yes, you are, Mohammed. Please proceed. Okay, okay, thanks. So, as I've said before, that uh, this motivation to the innovators and uh, to give the citizens protection for their innovation is very important for economic development, that's first. And also it encourages uh, people to work smart. Now, if you see all the innovations is about working smart, not using the, a lot of energy and a lot of time. So intellectual property itself is a very basic in terms of development. And I uh, would like to hear more from uh, William Agan on the unfair competition and how the, the intellectual property deals with that. Because uh, as we know, there are corporations that are global and we have this young uh, teenager want to start a business or he has innovated something 
and there's no any recognition and uh, you know there are, there are many people who have big ideas but they, they are afraid you know some some big company may take advantage of their ideas so this unfair competition from those who are not able to protect themselves you know even law it has people to fight for it even justice it is there written but uh, in the court of justice we need uh, an, an, an advocate that is smart and you will have to spend a lot of money for that so kindly uh, william again would like to hear on that side i'm very interested and all the mediators that are on board thanks a lot back to sarah mm -hmm. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, uh, for that uh, commentary, uh, which is actually a very good introduction to the session that uh, we are having today, uh, being able to look at uh, unfair competition and being able to look at IP uh, contributes to development. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Gan. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Agan. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Great to have you again. Um, we are looking forward to this uh, final tutorial series. Uh, uh, please uh, feel free to take us through. Uh, we're also looking forward to the recap and uh, you know, closing the whole session. Uh, welcome very much, uh, Mr. Agan. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, it's nice to be here once again. Uh, and uh, it's also very exciting to talk about this particular topic. And uh, I don't have to wait to finish the tutorial to wish all the uh, all my all of my colleagues. Uh, I don't know whether I should say luck, uh, but I wish you all the best in your upcoming exams. Thank you very much. Uh, today, we will be looking at uh, unfair competition and intellectual property and development. But before that, uh, allow me to take a few minutes to just recap on what we have uh, covered in the previous two tutorials, starting with the introduction. Uh, I have not prepared a slide for the same, uh, but I hope that uh, I will be able to nevertheless cover in brief uh, what we did last week. So now just give me a moment so that I can go all the way to today's presentation so that immediately I'm done with the recap. I then can continue on just uh, give me a moment. <clears throat> Yes. Okay, that's one of our topics for the day, but uh, yes, uh, we started uh, with patterns, but I will not uh, go, I will not go by any uh, particular order. Perhaps it would be fair to briefly look at the, in, at the introduction of uh, 
intellectual property. And at this point in time, uh, it's important to remember that from property law, looking at the classification of property law, intellectual property is classified as intangible personal property. Intangible meaning that we cannot, we cannot uh, feel it, we cannot use our senses. We cannot feel it, we cannot smell it, we cannot see it. Intangible. Uh, personal mean, mean, meaning that it has paternity, it has an owner, it has, it has an origin. So, and of course, being property means that it has all the elements of any property that one has. That is, you know, you can own it and you can deal with it like any other property, meaning that you can uh, sell it, you can lease it, you can license it, you can use it for collateral, etc., etc. So it is property in every, me in every way. However, this type of property is everything we think of and everything we dream to do. It is property of the mind. It is property of the mind. It is intellect. Broadly, divided into two uh, classes, and that is copyright and related rights and industrial property. So on the one, on the one hand, there is copyright and related rights. And on the other hand, we have industrial property and industrial property is now uh, where we discuss trademarks, patents, industrial designs, geographical indications, uh, plant breeders rights, uh, traditional knowledge uh, and genetic resources. Coming to copyright, copyright is a set of legal rights that provides the creator of work of art, literature, or music. So, Mr. Gan, uh, Mr. Gan, uh, yes, hello. Oh, you got muted for a bit. Go Sorry. on, please. Yes. Okay, where did you lose me? Uh, just the the past two, three or two, three sentences ago. Oh, sorry, sorry, very sorry. Yes, thank so, you. Yeah, so copyright, uh, to begin with copyright, it is a, a set of legal rights that provides the creator of art, literature, and music. So as long as an author, a composer, an artist, uh, has original work in those three categories. Such an author or an artist or a musician would have rights to that work. It is important in copyright that the work is an original expression of an idea. So it's not enough to say that one has an idea, it is very important that that idea be expressed. That idea that is expressed also should be original. So if the work is not original, then it will not be given copyright. Moreover, if the owner complaints about it, then the owner can actually have uh, two types of remedies, both civil and criminal. And this goes with both copyright and related rights. The protection of copyright varies 
but we go by the minimum as provided by TRIPS, which is an author's lifetime plus 50 years. Member states are allowed, nevertheless, to provide a higher uh, protection. There are some that, that, that provide, like in Europe, provide for up to 70 years. There are others that provide to up to 100 years. I think that's Mexico. So national laws can provide a higher can provide a higher protection duration, but they cannot provide a lower uh, protection because that is that would be going against the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. Now, related rights or neighboring rights are those that uh, are related to the what sometimes we call the cathedral, the cathedral of right of, 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 of right owners. And that is if, for example, there is a composer who composes a song, that composer may not necessarily be the person that will sing that song. So when we bring a singer, or when we bring a singer and a performer, then that other party will have related rights to the performance. And as such, they too have their rights and their rights are recognized both under national laws and uh, under international laws. However, the duration of protection for related or neighboring rights is lower, usually uh, 50 years or that is in broadcasting or can be even lower depending on the national laws. But what should be the take home here is the duration of related rights in itself indicates that their rights are not necessarily inferior, but because they derive from copyright, they do not enjoy the same duration of uh, protection as, as copyrights. Then uh, patents, you know, we began with this one because it's a heavy one, uh, is now an industrial design, it's an industrial uh, property. Patent, patent is an industrial property and it is a grant that is given by the government to an inventor of an invention in any field of technology as long as it meets a very strict threshold. And the threshold here is that the invention must be new or novel, must have an inventive step, meaning that it should not be obvious and must be of industrial applicability. The duration of protection of patent is 20 years. However, once a patentee has been given uh, or has been granted a patent, it is then a must for the patentee to maintain that patent yearly by paying an annual maintenance fee uh, every year for 20 years. Should the patentee not pay, then it would be very possible for the patent to lapse. So it's important that in as much as the patentee is protected for 20 years, it is important that he or the organization uh, maintains that patent uh, by paying an annual, uh, an annual fee. 
uh, in order for this patentee, in order for the inventor to be protected, there is a very important uh, principle, and that is the principle of disclosure. And disclosure here simply means that one gives the drawings, the descriptions, uh, the abstract, uh, and everything else that is required for Sita, person having uh, ordinary skill in the art, who, when making an application, would be equated to the patent examiner. That disclosure is in the form of a patent draft, which is drafted by a patent attorney. And that is what is used in the application by the patent examiner to determine the, uh, the inventive step that the applicant uh, is claiming. Enforcement, just like all industrial property, uh, there is no criminal uh, uh, complaint or charge that can be brought against industrial property, but the remedy is usually in a civil manner, meaning that anyone who infringes, uh, that is to say, uses any part of an existing patent without the permission of the original owner, can be sued uh, for, for damages uh, because they have gone against the rights of the owner because it is only the right, it is only the owner that has the right to sell, it is, uh, you know, to sell, to export, to license, et cetera, et cetera, or to even use uh, his, his, his patent. Then we also have industrial designs and industrial designs here are the exterior or the aesthetic part of a product, the aesthetic part of a product. Industrial designs can make or break an invention because most consumers or customers go by what they see on the outside. The ornamental part of a product the threshold again is that the design must be original and the applicant of an industrial design, uh, if the industrial design is granted, it will be granted in the form of a design patent usually. And the duration again uh, varies. Uh, but usually it can be, uh, the protection can be up to five years and renewable twice, uh, meaning that in most jurisdictions, uh, the duration of protection would be 15 years, but again, it can, it, it can go higher uh, than, than that. Uh, the industrial designs of any product places the product uh, in such a way that if the design is proper, if the design is nice, if the design is good, if it is appealing, then it can really boost uh, the business of the, the product. Then we have trademarks. Now, trademarks are also known in the business world as brands. So known as brands. Uh, 
but we know them as trademarks, but the two meanings really are, the two words are synonymous. Uh, uh, are signs or words or colors um, or design or a combination of all that. And in some jurisdictions, even the smell, uh, uh, which differentiates or which differentiate uh, the product of one trader from another. It distinguishes various products in the market. Registration is not necessary in trademarks. However, where one has not registered, the product will be the trademark. The product will be uh, protected by way of passing off, and it's something that we will also be looking at under unfair uh, competition. Registration of trademark, again, uh, one, a trademark examiner would look really, would look at the distinctiveness of a trademark in that the trademark that the owner has applied for registration must not be confusingly similar to an existing one. At the same time, there are certain trademarks that are of a defensive nature. For example, uh, a flag cannot be used by uh, a business person because it belongs to the state. Coat of arms cannot be used. These are defensive marks. They cannot be used. And, and any other mark, like for example, Red Cross or, 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 or Crescent, uh, red crescent are also defensive marks and those cannot be used. Now there are several types of trademarks. Uh, there are collective marks which are generally used by, uh, uh, by an association that comes together uh, and agree to use a certain mark, especially where they deal in similar products. And there are also certification marks, again, almost similar to collective marks, but with certification marks, uh, the idea that is sent to the consumer is that the, the various traders that have that particular certification mark uh, are those traders that send a message of a particular quality which they adhere to uh, in the market. Uh, again, just like any other industrial property, it's territorial in nature and as such, national laws protect, uh, protect uh, uh, trademarks and it is national laws that are really used uh, for registration of trademarks. That does not mean that it is not possible to use international uh, agreements. Madrid agreement and Madrid system uh, can be used uh, and these are administered by WIPO through what is referred to as a single filing system uh, where by just one, uh, by just filing from the uh, country of origin or rather through the country of origin to WIPO and designating the various countries where the applicant wants protection, WIPO then takes over and reaches out to those countries and does the legwork for the applicant. Uh, then we have uh, GIs. Uh, geographical indications. Now, geographical indications are those products, usually agricultural products, wines and alcohol, that have a certain distinctive taste. And that distinct taste is attributable to the geographical location where 
the product is grown. Uh, at the same time, there is another element and that is the element of appellation of origin. And that is, it goes now further into the peculiar uh, type of soil, peculiar type of weather, uh, the skills of the locals that is used for, uh, for, for making that product. Uh, and the, the altitude of the place, uh, if at all, uh, whether there is anything from the environment that uh, is also used uh, to, to produce such, such products. Uh, there is also indication of origin uh, that should also be understood when we talk of GI, and that is, it is important for a product to have a mark uh, of where it has actually been, uh, been, been, produ been produced, that is made in. Made in. Geographical indication is protected using national laws. Uh, and where national laws are not in place, like in Kenya, for example, then we in Kenya can protect uh, products of this nature uh, using uh, certification. Uh, marks under trademark trademark laws. The duration of a GI is really uh, it's, the duration of protection is in perpetuity, is in perpetuity, uh, and that actually makes it very very useful for traditional products and also brings a lot of development to the community from where these GIs are produced. Now there are emerging issues and those emerging issues have extended the protection of GI beyond uh, agricultural uh, products and wines and alcohol. And we are now seeing a trend where skills in other areas, like for example, Swiss watches or German cars or English vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are now, you know, and can enjoy uh, the benefits of GI because there is a dis there is there is something that is associated with such such uh, products to the skills of a particular people from a particular uh, from a particular place. Then we have traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, uh, and genetic resources. Now, we, I am from a school that distinguishes, and WIPO uh, also has distinguished traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. Now, traditional knowledge here would be knowledge originating from a local, traditional, or indigenous community. Now, in many countries, uh, the term indigenous is preferable uh, because indigenous uh, sends a message of authentic. In our country here in Kenya, uh, where I'm presenting from, we the late uh, His Excellency President Daniel Arab Moy left a precedent uh, when he described the term indigenous in Kenya to mean all tribes in Kenya. So in Kenya, all tribes are indigenous. And as such, uh, when it comes to terminology, uh, we have to be very, very careful because it is not in all countries that such a broad definition of indigenous is used. If we were to narrow 
that terminology in Kenya, for example, then we would perhaps then go to what we we understand as indigenous. Perhaps the El Molo would be an indigenous community. Uh, we've been very quick to describe the Maasai, perhaps Samburu, as indigenous community. I don't know how far that can go, but that would really then mean that because the Maasais have come out as loving their tradition very much, then the term indigenous, as understood in other jurisdictions, could be applied to the, the Maasai or the El Moro. The easiest way to understand traditional knowledge, which is also in academics, uh, referred to as indigenous intellectual property, is to link it with patenting. Because uh, when we look at some of the terminology that is used in describing traditional knowledge, we find that we are talking of uh, the result of intellectual activity uh, and insight in a traditional context, including know-how, skills, innovations, practices, and learning. Now, those terms are very, very close to patenting. Uh, I know that we, we do not have another module. We don't have a module for another smaller uh, patent. Uh, in many countries, it's, it's referred to as a petty patent. I, in, in Kenya, we refer to it as utility model, but don't bother, it's not in your, in your syllabus. But we can also, uh, the reason why I brought up utility models or, pat or, or petty patents is because uh, we have a trend where it is very possible for us to protect uh, some traditional knowledge by way of utility model because being a petty patent from even from the terminology the threshold is lowered the threshold is lowered in that it does not it is it is an invention that does not have, does not need inventive step and in Kenya and in many other countries uh, utility models are not examined. They don't go through that thorough examination. So tr traditional knowledge would really be associated more with industrial property uh, by way of perhaps utility model and, 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 and patent. What's important is that this is knowledge that has been handed over from generation to generation. And in most countries, it's uncoded. In a few countries, it is coded and as such, is in the public domain. I think even before we go to TCEs, so that I don't repeat the same when I'm <coughs> recapping on TCEs, is that there is a concept of ownership uh, under traditional knowledge that is very different from our initial definition of property when we talked of personal. Traditional knowledge is not perceived or not taken as personal property because of the communal manner in which traditional communities live. So it is usually property that is communal. However, it does not mean that it does not originate from an individual. The concept of trusteeship goes beyond a council of elders that have been entrusted with property belonging to the uh, traditional communities. So take home here is the concept of ownership, the concept of ownership of traditional knowledge, traditional culture, cultural expressions is communal and cannot be individual or personal. And where a person owns that knowledge individually, he too is regarded as owning that knowledge in trust of the community. And it is because of that, that <clears throat> if there is a community that is 
that comes from outside of that community and needs knowledge from this particular community. It is a must that the elders that have been entrusted with traditional knowledge in the community consent after being informed of the exact purpose of divulging such knowledge, what is referred to as PIC, prior informed consent, and this is also found in uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, when we come to traditional cultural expressions, again, we are talking of expressions, and where have we mentioned this? We've mentioned this under copyright. Uh, these are ideas that are expressed from a traditional community that are exactly the same as those uh, as understood under copyright. And that is traditional songs, uh, traditional art, and uh, the, the traditional stories, folklore, okay? Also sometimes referred to as expressions of, 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 of folklore. Uh, protection for both traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions, again, is an area that uh, is very, very slippery because traditional communities do not have a cap on the ownership of what comes from their communities. And as such, their approach is that their, their products, their indigenous intellectual property belongs to them in perpetuity. And as such, even if these communities were to seek protection from the mainstream protection, they would rather, they would rather go for those protections that have an element of perpetuity uh, in them. Trademarks that are protected for 10 years but can be renewed in perpetuity, for example. GIs that can be renewed in perpetuity. Uh, trade secrets that can be renewed uh, in perpetuity. And because they, they believe that there is no way their, their, their indigenous intellectual property uh, can just expire. Then we also have the element of genetic resources, which is extremely important and interrelated to TCEs and TKs or expressions of folklore. Why? Everything traditional knowledge, everything traditional cultural expressions or expressions of folklore uh, depends on the genetic resources, on the biodiversity of the communities, uh, because all these are derived from the environment. Now, what's important to understand here, again, is that there is biopiracy when a person considered to be an outsider, someone coming from outside of that community, gets to, without prior informed consent, uh, gets hold of the information of the traditional community and uses it elsewhere and exploits it elsewhere. Such a person will be, will have committed the act of biopiracy in that he has taken away knowledge without the consent of the community. What is expected and what is respected is bioprospecting, which again, of course, also goes through its own licensing procedures, especially where uh, the person is from outside the country, now the you know, bigger territory, uh, where you bioprospect 
without anybody's help. What has been seen under TK, TCGs, and the outsiders, so to speak, basically, and especially, sorry, especially from other countries where the technology there is higher, would come, they would, um, they would not untwist, but they would uh, connive with an individual person who has such knowledge, and then they take away that particular knowledge or that particular sample to their countries and the same because they have the technology. If, for example, it is a hub that is known for healing, for example, the Western or the, let me not call it Western countries, but a country that has got uh, high technology can actually identify the active compound of that particular, that particular hub and thereafter uh, patents the same. And you now understand that once he patents it, then it would mean that it belongs to him because he is the one who uh, will have, so to speak, done the experiment and identified that particular compound. That would be biopiracy and there are cases, the last time we referred to the case of Mississippi, and there are so many other interesting cases, the Mississippi case or the turmeric case where University of Mississippi uh, patented turmeric because turmeric has got uh, antibiotic uh, 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 features. But the Indians then said, no, we've known that for thousands of years, and as such, it cannot be uh, Mississippi cannot claim uh, that it is the one that has uh, discovered that. Then we also have plant breeders' uh, rights. And when we talk of plant breeders, uh, this is where we talk of plant variety protection. And under plant variety protection, uh, we look at, yes, issues novelty, but more importantly, the breeders take very many years to come up with uh, a particular variety that has got novelty, that has got distinctness, uniformity, and stability. And such uh, breeders need protection, and the type of protection that is, 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 that is given to them is what is referred to as the plant breeders uh, plant breeders right. These are intellectual property rights uh, in as much as they are uh, protected under a different uh, regime. I believe that we have covered uh, in a nutshell uh, or I have recapped what we uh, covered in the first and the second uh, tutorial. First and the second tutorial. And now if it is okay, we can go to the two topics of the day. And this is unfair competition and intellectual property and uh, development. Now, unfair competition has a very wide meaning. And uh, there is 
definition given by World Intellectual Property Organization and the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property. However, looking at both definitions, one would realize that there are several similar similarities. Uh, starting with the definition according to WIPO. Any false or unjustifiable uh, allegation in the course of industrial or commercial activities that discredits or is likely to discredit another enterprise or its activities, in particular, the product or services offered by such enterprise shall constitute an act of unfair competition. Now, when we look at that definition, when we look at the highlighted terms, false, meaning that there is a, an intentional motive to give the public or to give the consumer a very different picture about the activities or the products of a competitor. When we discredit another competitor's products that are as a result of industrial or commercial activities, again, these also constitute forms of unfair uh, competition. The, the Paris Convention also brings out really similar uh, traits of unfair competition. And we see it in acts that create confusion. You know. Or those that constitute false allegations. Or indications or allegations which may mislead the public. These, when you look at them carefully, you realize that they they are can we call them infringements under different aspects of intellectual property but have been brought out in this broad uh, topic of unfair competition uh, with a reason. And we shall look at that uh, step by step. Now, when we look at the broader meaning of unfair competition, we also add to that previous meaning, uh, something touching on disclosure of confidential information, disclosure of trade secrets. Sometimes referred to as breach of trust because there are secrets that we are entrusted with, which gives a competitive edge to a certain enterprise. 
So when an employee, for example, discloses that trade secret, it automatically would mean that another enterprise will now be able to compete uh, with the enterprise from where that secret has been stolen, sometimes referred to as industrial or commercial uh, espionage. There are also acts or practices that in the course of industrial or commercial activities, just damage the goodwill of another enterprise. From trademarks, from our discussion of trademarks, we talked of known marks, known marks, and these are marks that enjoy uh, a certain place in the marketplace because they do not need to be registered. Uh, they do not need to be registered. They are, they, are, they are marks that are well known and are protected under the Vienna Convention. Now, Adidas, as an example, is known uh, for several sports uh, sports sports artifacts uh, whether shoes or uh, tops or, uh, uh, shorts socks or whatever you know very well known for sports now if a trader then decided that they want to damage the goodwill of Adidas, then they would come up with a totally different product. And I think so that I can unpack this further, remember we referred to classification of goods and services under the NIS nice, uh, classification which is used when an applicant makes an application for registration of a trademark. So under this classification, different goods are classified in different classes. So you find that Adidas perhaps has classified, actually has classified its goods under a class that caters for you know clothes, etc., uh, etc., et clothes, shoes, etc., etc. Now, when you have a trader that decides that they now want to come up with a product and a class of stationery, and they want to make rubbers, eraser or erasers, uh, sharpeners, uh, pens and pencils and they use the Adidas mark, we will then construe that particular activity as an activity that is directed at damaging the goodwill of Adidas. Again, categories of unfair competition just come from the very definition, let me just go back, the very definition uh, of unfair competition. A broad area, but these categories that have been reduced into around six just come from those definitions. When a trader causes confusion, that becomes an act of unfair competition. An example that I picked from, uh, from the module is a very popular case of Toys R Us versus Games R Us. 
Now, what's important about this, and is very common actually in matters trademarks, is that a different trader comes uh, to the market, realizes that the trademark toys are us, sells, and decides to come up with his product and names his products games are us. But the interesting thing is, even as he brings in games are us, this particular trader uh, then does not use a distinctive color scheme. What, the, what does that tell? The trader does that very well so that that ordinary consumer of toys that us will confuse games are us perhaps because of color and because of the last two syllables are and us. This is something that is unfair to the original owners of the trademark. Another category is seen in misleading uh, marks or misleading comments or misleading uh, uh, information. And this is very, very common where, for example, uh, A person looking for certain content in food, and allow me without referring to any 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 any, any trader. Today, most people are health conscious, and the health conscious prefer buying confectionery that is having a certain percentage of roughages. So, because the traders are aware of that, yes, they would come in to the market and say that a particular confectionery, be it bread or something, is brown bread with the uh, this percentage of, uh, of uh, roughages and all that kind of thing, and yet that is not true. That would be unfair to the consumer. Be unfair to the consumer. Uh, another example is where locals prefer products that are made locally. So a trader would come and realize that locals prefer products or their own products and he imports products and those imported products are labeled as made locally. That would also be uh, an act or a category of unfair uh, competition discrediting competitors. Now this is a gray one because different national laws uh, provide for different, uh, uh, different protection, if at all. Now in certain countries like in Europe, where it is evident that a computer has been discredited, then such an act would be considered as a wrong. The term taught here simply means a wrong. Uh, uh, a wrong uh, that is not in criminal, in a criminal manner. Uh, you know, a tort would be like the tort of negligence or the tort of defamation, etc., uh, etc. Et so here, 
in continental Europe where a competitor has been discredited, he can bring an action in tort, an action in tort. It's a civil, it's a civil uh, uh, act and he can be compensated by way of a civil remedy. However, this sort of disparagement, when you look at it, is stricter because discrediting can also be seen as an act of, a tort of defamation, okay? But disparagement would be a stricter form uh, of, of, of action against such a competitor. And yet, there are countries that would not uh, take it very seriously uh, if such competitors are discredited. And this is very, very important. And we will, it's very important in business. The reason why it's important in business is because if I am a business person, then I would usually look for a country that has got national laws that can protect me. So it's important that uh, countries look into uh, that aspect. Disclosure of secret information. Again, um, there is secret information, trade secrets, uh, confidential information. Different countries provide for different uh, uh, protection. There are certain countries that are not very friendly to trade secrets because of the nature of protection, because trade secrets are actually protected in perpetuity. Uh, again, you know, the difference here between secret information and uh, confidential information is again in terms of protection. Uh, confidential information can be usually uh, protected for a shorter duration of time, depending on how parties have agreed. In most cases, there would be maybe a cap of three to five years for, uh, for, for, such, uh, for such information. But for, sick, for trade secrets, the law has it that trade secrets, as long as uh, that secret can be uh, protected, then that secret remains uh, uh, in perpetuity. Taking advantage of another's achievements, uh, and this is free riding. Again, this is very common. Uh, even if you are to go to the supermarket today, you'll find that uh, there are certain products, yes, they belong to different traders, but uh, when you look at the distinctiveness, you will actually struggle to differentiate between, between the two. Of course, uh, there is a different approach to this. We look at distinctiveness of a mark. However, it is also important to note that trademark laws forbid an applicant from owning certain uh, uh, fr from owning numbers or owning words or owning colors, okay? So because of that, there are certain, and it's important to understand this, there are certain uh, industries that can be identified using certain colors. Meat, the meat industry, for example, is synonymous with red, okay? It's synonymous with red. So you can find hundreds of traders using the color red. 
Now, we, we cannot then say that because other traders are using that color, uh, that there is free riding here. What we are saying here is that in addition to the color, there is also a mark. And surely there are certain marks that can just be twisted in such a way, but are not distinct from the prevailing ones. That is where we can then say, or that's when we can say that uh, there is free riding of uh, free riding by one trader of the achievements of another trader. Then comparative advertisement. Again, I know in many countries, this is the order of the day. Uh, I don't want to give examples in our own countries, but every other time there are some adverts, you can easily see uh, that there are, you know, some kind of wars uh, where one advert, one advertising, uh, it's not the company, but one advertising a certain product would actually, uh, in a very unfair way, indicate that the other product, you know, lacks certain things, which sometimes may not, which most of the time may not be true, uh, or is associated with something that is really not very uh, pleasing. And as such, uh, that can also uh, uh, comprise unfair competition. I think what's important to note here is that unfair competition on its own is very broad. But in as much as there are laws that are in place that could either be within intellectual property laws or could be separate laws like consumer protection laws, for example, or laws uh, preventing unfair trade. Uh, these laws that are directly associated with unfair competition are not and cannot be used for protecting or registering uh, intellectual property uh, rights. However, when it comes to protection of intellectual property rights, then it is a must for us to use the specific laws that are used for protecting uh, intellectual uh, property. Remedies, of course, anti-competition laws and laws of passing off. Now, laws of passing off, I think for those that have been in these tutorials will remember that it is closely associated with unregistered trademarks, unregistered trademarks. And we can also, we can also replace passing off with unfair uh, competition laws. So, so where, for example, uh, there is confusion, where, where there, is, there is evidence of causing confusion uh, under, under trademark, which is very common in trademark, uh, all we have to do is to establish whether the offending party is registered. If the offending party is registered, then of course we can protect that, uh, we can protect the applicant or we can protect the plaintiff uh, using the necessary trademark uh, infringement law. But where the applicant, uh, where the, the offender is not registered, then we can actually protect the applicant using and using anti-competition laws, okay? Or we can say using common law of passing off. So anti-competition laws and laws of passing off are both remedies for uh, certain types of uh, unfair 
uh, trade practices. Then, of course, we had indicated a tort of disparagement, <clears throat> which is used uh, where uh, a competitor discredits uh, the product of another competitor. Right, let's go to IPN development, uh, which will be our last module. <clears throat> uh, and thereafter, uh, we can then uh, go back to Esther, to Sarah, uh, uh, for questions. For questions. So intellectual property and development is rather a yes, it is a wide topic, it's very multifaceted, and it touches on very many areas of development, of culture, of society. of economics and is actually a very new module even in universities and this is because of the importance of what is referred to as the development agenda uh, that was introduced by uh, Argentina and Brazil in 2004, but which has been a topic for discussion right from the 1960s. So let us look at the topic the best way we can. Of course, we know that intellectual property uh, after 1994 became part of trade. Actually, that is the very first time when it became part of trade. And when it became part of trade, it then uh, meant that it would very much be protected by members of the World Trade Organization because uh, the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property is a WTO uh, uh, agreement. Uh, but where does WIPO come in? And why uh, is it very much in the heart of development? Let's begin by looking at the term development itself. What is development? Now, traditionally, uh, we look at development uh, from uh, how modern an economy is, the growth in terms of uh, certain economic metrics, such as uh, the GDP uh, per capita, uh, gross domestic product per capita. Uh, and many other uh, uh, economic metrics. However, and what is of more concern to WIPO is a very different approach that is associated in many ways with Amartya Sen. Uh, an Indian economist and a Nobel Prize winner, a lecturer uh, at Trinity College, uh, London, who brought out a more modern approach and it is an approach that is acceptable today. Of course, in addition to, uh, we can't run away from the traditional approach, but this modern approach is the capabilities approach where 
Economic growth is valued for facilitating human freedom. Facilitating human freedom. And we look at this uh, uh, step by step. Freedom would be worthless without capabilities to enjoy uh, even where we have the money. But what are these capabilities? One needs good health, clean environment, quality education, uh, vibrant art and culture, and food security. These are capabilities that make freedom worthwhile, that make freedom worthwhile. One can have the money, but if you don't have the good health, for example, then uh, you would really not enjoy your freedom. One needs clean environment, et cetera, et cetera. So just like any factor of production in economic growth, intellectual property, being property, is also one of those important factors for growth, and this is where it comes uh, to play uh, in development uh, generally. Countries can achieve these growths through the following examples. Copyright, patent protection, and compulsory licensing. Uh, patent protection and compulsory licensing uh, have, are actually uh, related because we talked of compulsory licensing uh, uh, when we discussed patents. But again, compulsory licensing uh, it can also be on its own because it is also very possible to invoke this uh, where there is copyright. So when we look at the extension of protection, uh, that is the flexibilities that are in intellectual property. Remember that we always talk of minimum protection under TRIPS, which is uh, life of the author plus 50 years. Now, we have countries that have extended, as we had indicated earlier in the recap, that have extended this beyond 50 years. Now the question would be, when we extend this beyond 50 years, would there be development uh, uh, in that particular region? Will the individual estate uh, uh, benefit if there is an extension? Uh, of this particular right, it could be debatable, but the thinking here is the longer the protection, the more the royalties that uh, the estate of the deceased owner enjoys. So that could be one way uh, of looking at it. Of course, this is a very deb debatable area, and I can actually assure you that there are some who argue that development would be faster if uh, countries do not protect, uh, give protection beyond the minimum. I leave it to your judgment. Now, patent protection again under Article 27.3b uh, of TRIPS on the extent of protection beyond human intervention is also known as TRIPS flexibility. This is because uh, there are, yes, patent law is there to protect inventions from all fields of technology. However, there are certain uh, rather controversial 
inventions, okay, uh, so to speak, that raise eyebrows. Inventions like, for example, uh, in the case of Chakrabarti, who was given a patent uh, for uh, discovering, so to speak, uh, bacteria that can easily ingest on oil. Now, the US protected Chakrabarti, Chakrabarti's bacteria, uh, because the US uh, made use of this flexibility. In certain countries, national laws do not protect such inventions. The University of uh, Harvard, Harvard University rather, and their popular Oncomouts, okay, you know, said that. Uh, they invented a special transgenic uh, mouse and the US Patent and Trademark Office protected the Onco mouse. Okay, protected the Onco mouse. Uh, but the same is not done in other countries. In fact, the neighboring country, Canada, could not do that because Canada then indicated that it does not play God. So there are flexibilities that countries have used, but again, all these flexibilities depend on uh, the culture, the perhaps economic situations and the so societies in those particular countries. Uh, yes, uh, do these flexibilities assist countries in development, it can be debatable because let's take the example of the Onco mouse, the Harvard mouse, it's also called the Harvard mouse. The Harvard mouse uh, being transgenic and using genetic uh, engineering uh, has been engineered to have cancerous cells, okay? What is the argument of, university, uh, of Harvard? What is the argument of the scientists from that university? They say that they can now conduct uh, research on cancer so that it can help them in, uh, uh, in the area of cancer and possibly in looking for solutions or of treatment of the same. So again, I leave it to your judgment, but yes, these are the discussions that we have in IP and development. They are, they are, they are not very uh, straightforward. Okay? They are they're very debatable. Compulsory licensing, again, uh, this one is, is a darling actually is a darling of, uh, of uh, very many third world countries where, you know, medicine bought from, uh, from companies with existing patents uh, is very unaffordable, very, very unaffordable for most poor countries. You know, we have third world countries, we have we have developing countries and we also have least developed countries. And for least developed countries, uh, really purchasing such medicine or making that medicine available uh, to its population can be, can be very difficult. And as such, these countries then thrive on compulsory licensing of such uh, medicines to other companies so that the generics that are then manufactured can be accessed at a cheaper price. 
we have several examples uh, back home here. We have uh, South Africa, we have Rwanda, the next door. We also have Thailand uh, that are on record to have granted compulsory licensing for antiretroviral, uh, antiretrovirals for HIV and AIDS. So more ways of gripping from intellectual property uh, flexibilities, sometimes also referred to as TRIPS flexibilities, is that it's not a reserve of countries, but universities, companies, and organizations can also benefit uh, through uh, partnerships and collaborations with other universities, with other organizations. Uh, private companies can also benefit from these collaborations with universities. This is something that is very, very common in many countries. Patent pooling uh, is another way of uh, benefiting. Uh, patent pooling is where different patent owners bring their patents together through a very intricate agreement where they allow the other uh, parties to access their patents without going through expensive uh, licensing arrangements. Uh, and this is very, very common in medicine and uh, in other areas of technology as well. Of course, again, as I, I, I had indicated earlier, this is a topic that you'll find most of these are debatable. There are others that have, be, have, have indicated that patent pooling in itself is an act of uh, unfair uh, competition because you'll have a few giants you know agreeing to patent pool and come up with state of the art technologies and really literally knocking off uh, the other smaller players but again yes patent pooling is also uh, the way to go then commercialization or monetization of a patent and not just a patent, but also other intellectual property uh, rights uh, is, again, uh, a way through licensing, a way of, uh, uh, of bringing development uh, to countries. If you cannot commercialize your intellectual property uh, by using intellectual property flexibilities, then uh, it is similar to, you know, the same example that had given, I think, in the first tutorial when we discussed patents, <clears throat> and that is where you own a flat, and yet there is no one uh, staying in that flat, but you say the flat is yours, uh, and you stay elsewhere. So it is important that you commercialize. Uh, intellectual property because that is then what brings in uh, the monetary gains that one uh, with, with property uh, looks for. Then protection by trade secrets, again, to be ahead of competition. Uh, is also uh, take a reaping from intellectual property flexibilities, trade secrets. This is uh, uh, recognized by TRIPS uh, as one of the, the intellectual property rights, uh, trade secrets and confidential information. So now, Having said that, what then is the role of WIPO uh, in development? We 
start by looking at WIPO's mandate. When it was first established, it was basically to protect intellectual property all over the world. However, in the mid 70s, when it became a specialized agency of the UN, it now had to have direct connection to development of its member states, development of its member states. Then again, now post 1970 till date, uh, WIPO has been tasked to promote creative intellectual activity and technology transfer or sometimes you know we just abbreviate it as tt or tech transfer to developing countries yes uh, technology transfer would be from advanced countries or developed countries to developing countries in order to accelerate economic, social, and cultural development. Allow me to mention here that very many third world countries or developing countries have not capitalized on this particular uh, aspect. Uh, and yet, this is very much a feature of the WTO agreement also, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property, uh, where uh, the developing countries, especially least developing, uh, the developed countries, uh, can enter into arrangements with advanced countries for the sake of transferring technology to them, transferring technology to them. Uh, there are a few countries that have taken this very seriously and uh, today are, have built their economies uh, to unbelievable proportions. We talk of Asian tigers today, but really you know, the Asian tigers understood this concept much earlier, much earlier. You know, when we talk of transfer of technology, what we are seeing here is we have basic technology in a certain area. Allow me to give you an example. Uh, the Indians have several local manufacturing companies. Okay, perhaps let me give the example of the automotive industry in India. Uh, they have manufacturing, local manufacturing companies that manufacture trucks. It is one called Ashoka. They have, uh, you know, scooter manufacturing companies uh, uh, like Bajaj, for example. And uh, let me tell you, there are so many examples I can give from that. I can give from that country. Let's stick to these two, 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 two examples so that this can be well understood. Now, Ashoka being a truck manufacturing company entered into an arrangement with Leyland from England in a technology transfer arrangement. And that collaboration then gave birth to a super truck called Ashoka Leyland. Now, today, even in Kenya, if you haven't noticed, we have so many Ashok, Ashok Leyland trucks, and they're very good trucks. Now, what does that mean? When India exports its trucks to other countries, it automatically means that there will be serious economic uh, development for that country. Uh, the other example, Bajaj. Bajaj is actually a, an Indian local manufacturing scooter company, enters into uh, a technology transfer arrangement with uh, a Japanese motorcycle company called Kawasaki. And then they come up with, I think half the motorcycles in my country here are K Bajaj. See, now that again is a 
very good example of countries that have, you know, taken advantage of tech transfer in developing their economies. Further functions of WIPO, it administers processes of protecting intellectual property rights internationally. Of course, we've seen some of the examples like the Madrid uh, agreements and Madrid uh, uh, protocol for uh, single filing of trademarks, for example, uh, which is administered by WIPO. It also provides training and education, legislative and technical assistance. Uh, this is the best example, of course, I'm not from WIPO, but the exam that you're preparing for is a WIPO exam. Uh, and as such, uh, the, you know, it's evident that this is another function. I first, uh, other than my undergrad, because in my undergrad, I also did intellectual property, but what interested me to further uh, delve into the world of intellectual property was when I was nominated to Harare to attend a WIPO uh, training on intellectual property years ago. So WIPO uh, provides very good training, uh, seminars, uh, and does sensitizations uh, all over uh, the world among uh, uh, the, the, member, the member states. It's also a reservoir, yes, it's also a reservoir of databases of IP-related information. Today, you can type in anything, and Google search will take you to WIPO, as long as it is intellectual property related, and you will get information uh, from WIPO. Huge role, huge function. Uh, now, as had been indicated earlier, intellectual property and development has been a subject of discussion since the 1960s. Member states, NGOs, all contribute to this debate. But now, the most crucial one was the one that was contributed by Brazil and Argentina in 2004, which then gave birth to new and specific development agenda. And we shall look at these uh, one by one. What is WIPO development agenda? This agenda ensures that development considerations form an integral part of WIPO's work. Of course, its mandate in the light of development agenda goes beyond protection of IP. Remember that WIPO is a UN uh, specialized agency. And as such, it recognizes the benefits and costs of intellectual property in light of social, cultural, and economic issues. Uh, of course, there's detailed information uh, on that WIPO website. But briefly, and for our discussion today, we shall look at the clusters of the agenda. And uh, from this particular topic, it will be important that you read widely because even on the module, understanding each cluster calls for reading more and more uh, articles as provided by WIPO, uh, but for discussion's sake, we shall look at each of them uh, very briefly. The first cluster uh, is uh, cluster A. There are six clusters in the WIPO development agenda. This agenda has a total of 45 recommendations which are listed under the six clusters. And uh, these 45 recommendations, again, are available on the WIPO uh, website. I know that even on the module, 
they have not given all the 45 recommendations. However, they have picked a few recommendations for the purposes of discussion and understanding. What is important here is that the recommendations, I think all recommendations except one, which we will be looking at towards the end, uh, all of these recommendations that have been given as an example in this module uh, were those identified uh, by the 2007 General Assembly for immediate implementation. So that is the reason why they have uh, decided to use, and it's not just these ones, there are several other recommendations. If you go to the WIPO website and go through those 45 recommendations, you realize that those recommendations with an asterisk are those that have been identified for immediate implementation. The others that do not have an asterisk are those that are in, pro in, 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 in progress. So let's look at this first uh, recommendation. Uh, recommendation one, under the first, under, under, under cluster A, is on technical assistance and capacity building. It has several recommendations under it. And this is the one that stands out. It says that WIPO technical assistance shall be inter alia development oriented. So the technical assistance shall be development oriented, demand driven and transparent, taking into account the priorities and the special needs of developing countries especially least developed countries, as well as the different levels of development of member states. Activities should include time frames for completion. In this regard, design, delivery mechanisms and evaluation processes of technical assistance programs should be country specific. Uh, an example, uh, there is another recommendation, of course, recommendation 14, uh, that can be read together with recommendation one. Uh, and here, what has been approved is increasing, if you look at the right side of the, of the box, increasing the, the role of women uh, in innovation and entrepreneurship, supporting women from developing countries, in using the intellectual property system more effectively. And this, of course, comes from uh, studies and research that have been conducted uh, in terms of the place uh, of women in innovation and enterprise. Uh, then we go to the second cluster, cluster B, which is norm setting flexibilities, public policy, and public domain. Again, same thing, uh, recommendation 15 uh, is for immediate implementation. And in norm setting activities, uh, they shall be ex inclusive and, and, and member driven, take into account different levels of development, take into consideration a balance between costs and benefits, be a participatory process, which takes into consideration the interests and priorities of all WIPO member states and the viewpoints of other stakeholders, including admitting, uh, including, including accredited intergovernmental organizations and uh, non-government organizations, NGOs and be in line with the principle of neutrality of the WIPO secretariat. Now, as a result of this recommendation, and uh, I believe, I think recommendation 20, uh, there is a project that was approved and is on. And this is the project uh, that is in line with the recommendations on bringing uh, whatever it is that WIPO does to the public domain. And one of the milestones here is the patent scope. Now, patent scope is a portal uh, 
uh, which can be accessed. Uh, and it was first developed in 2013. As a result of a WIPO study recommending the establishment of a global portal. Now, what happens is that if you want to get information about, about anything patent, you can access this WIPO portal uh, through what is famously known as the patent scope. And you'll get information on whether that patent, uh, one, whether that patent uh, is active, whether it has expired, uh, who are the owners, which countries uh, has the patent been protected in, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that the member states can easily uh, access this information for development. Remember the discussion that we had uh, during uh, the tutorial on patenting, where we looked into leveraging on information that is out there for the purposes of reverse engineering because it is ridiculous, really, in the IP world to purport to be inventing the wheel and yet it has already been invented. So there is no reinvention as such. All one has to do is to capitalize on the information that is out there in all fields of technology. And one then needs to just reverse engineer, especially where the patents, please, where the patents have expired, because this, that's when we can now say that they are in public domain. But information is power. So you can go, th can, uh, go through the portal, get that information through patent scope, and easily, easily get any patent that has expired and exploit that patent. Uh, you repeat, exploit that patent. Uh, without the permission uh, of the owner. <laughs> then C, cluster C, technology transfer, information and communication technologies, and access to knowledge. Again, this is one of those recommendations that were identified for immediate implementation. Uh, recommendation 25. And there are several projects, and I've picked one of the projects uh, that have made it possible for institutions to manage intellectual property rights, to set up uh, and run technology transfer offices, to explore licensing uh, agreements for the purposes of transferring technology uh, and to also enhance capacity to draft patents. And this particular last one is really, really heavy because we have innovators, but we do not have patent attorneys in developed, developing countries that can draft patents that are up to the standard that is required for the purposes of application for patents. So this is a very, very uh, useful agenda, particularly for uh, developing countries. In fact, even our laws themselves, let me give the example of our own Kenyan law. In our Kenyan law, we do not even have a a provision for patent attorneys. We don't have. We only have provisions for patent agents. So you can see that that in itself discourages the need for enhancing the capacity to have attorneys that can actually draft patents. That actually can draft patents. As opposed to uh, you know, countries that are advanced. Uh, we have 
patent uh, drafters in South Africa, in Africa, uh, patent attorneys in the US, uh, in, 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 in the UK, in Europe, you know, serious, serious patent attorneys uh, that uh, help inventors from all uh, fields in making sure that the patent drafts uh, uh, are of such quality that can be used by the various patent offices. Cluster D, uh, assessment, evaluation, and impact studies. Again, this is uh, a one of those recommendations, recommendation 37, under this cluster. Uh, that was identified for immediate implementation. Uh, upon requ request, and as directed by member states, WIPO may conduct studies on the protection of IP to identify the possible links and impacts between IP and development. And the project uh, that came as a result of this recommendation is the project on economic and social development that has the following broad themes. The national and original use of intellectual property systems. Again, national here is where we talk of a jurisdiction of a country. Regional is where we talk of an organization of various countries that come together in a particular region. In Africa here, for example, we have OAPI, which is an organization for French-speaking uh, countries. We also have ARIPO, which is again an organization for English-speaking countries. So, you know, uh, that's, that, that's the difference. Domestic innovation, uh, domestic again meaning you know, a smaller jurisdiction uh, that is within a particular country. The international and national diffusion of knowledge, okay, how does that, uh, how, how do the two uh, benefit uh, a user? Institutional features of the IP system and its economic Im implication you know, whether uh, the IP system of a particular nation, uh, a particular country or a particular region uh, has had any impact. Uh, remember, we are talking of matters development, whether uh, the intellectual property system of a particular uh, region or a particular country has a certain impact or an economic implication in that particular uh, country. Then we have cluster E, and here we have <coughs> institutional matters, including mandate and governance. Ideally, this is, uh, you know, the last uh, uh, cluster. We have another cluster which is very broad. This one has got, you know, this also has got several recommendations and. Two of those recommendations, uh, recommendation 40, uh, has not, was not identified for uh, immediate implementation, but recommendation 42 was. And one of the implementation here is that WIPO has worked with NGOs, and this I can tell you for free, uh, because there are several non-government non non-government organizations that attend various WIPO uh, seminars uh, with different development agenda. Uh, and some of those that are very outstanding are those NGOs that represent um, rights of traditional or indigenous uh, groups, you know, but NGOs from Australia, that work very closely with WIPO, 
in matters of traditional knowledge and expressions of folklore uh, of the Aboriginal community in Australia. Uh, to give uh, but an example, we have other NGOs from India, from Brazil, Panama, Philippines. Uh, at the time we were, we were seriously thinking of establishing such for Kenya, you know, uh, because it's very much part of what WIPO would like to see uh, in its development agenda. Then under recommendation 40, uh, you know, an ongoing, it's working closely to other uh, United Nations agencies like UNCTAD, UNEP, World Health Organization, UNESCO, uh, and other organizations like WTO, all uh, with the aim of uh, bringing out a very, very uh, good relationship between intellectual property and development of member states. Now, under recommendation 45, under cluster F, this is actually the only recommendation. This again brings out something very, very beautiful uh, that we have been struggling with, we continue struggling with, and that is intellectual property enforcement, uh, where we now say that we are shifting from intellectual property enforcement to respect for intellectual uh, property. It's been a nightmare, and there have been concerns by member states. There have been concerns by various countries uh, about enforcement. Several countries have beautiful intellectual property laws. And of course, after 1994, member states uh, signatories to the WTO had to change their laws to mirror the agenda of WTO. And when you look at those laws, really, you find that there is so much that we have in common, especially when it comes to minimum protection. However, the nightmare that is there is in enforcement of, of these, these laws. So WIPO, through recommendation 45 now, is looking at a broader approach. How can we then uh, take to the society the importance of respecting intellectual property? Can there be uh, can there be a uh, a shift in the manner in which people perceive intellectual property. There are countries that are known to be notorious, notorious in piracy. Is it possible for us to understand, for example, why, you know, societal reasons, yeah, cultural reasons? Let, allow me to give you the example of China. And this is authoritative. We are very quick at pointing a finger at China that, oh, China is copycat. But we don't take time to understand where China is coming from. China is very, very much a communal culture where people shared everything. And this is not just in their politics. This is 
part of their culture for thousands of years. And as such, talking to China about copyright, talking to China about intellectual property is something that China has really agreed to very recently because it has never been part of their culture. I've discovered something beautiful. I will share it with all and sundry so that another person can benefit from what it is that I have discovered. So can we then also understand cultures? What about matters, uh, economic uh, prowess? Could it be possible that people are into piracy because they would rather get stuff for free? Is it because they don't have the money? Okay, what about those who have the money and yet they would rather get a pirated copy? So what exactly is the problem? These are issues which uh, WIPO in its development agenda, and in particular under cluster F, uh, is looking into. Uh, you notice that again, this is not slated for immediate uh, implementation, but it is an ongoing process. And I believe that once there is that shift from enforcement to respect of IP, perhaps from very early on in our system of education, or for Africans, this is what I'm saying, can we go back to what we used to be, you know, uh, people who respect other people's properties, for example, whether this can be uh, a way of having a paradigm shift about intellectual property. And if we can then have that paradigm shift, then it would be possible perhaps to develop much, much further than where we are. Back to you, Sarah. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Gunn. Uh, that has been quite, uh, quite a bit of content to close up. Um, I think it would be nice to go for a break. Uh, but just before we go for the break, I would like uh, to just read a, a comment uh, from one of the participants. Uh, we will be able to, to take in more questions and comments uh, right after the break uh, from participants when we come back. Uh, but uh, just a, a quick one. It says, um, I take this opportunity to thank Wasiliana Hart and the presenter, Advocate Agan, for the well-prepared tutorials. As learners, we have been empowered and are looking forward to sit for the exams. We assure you that we shall use the informed knowledge in the future, especially when handling mediation-related disputes. Uh, thank you. And that is from Honorable Washika Washira, who has been with us in all uh, the sessions. Um, so at this particular time, I will invite uh, um, convener Wangari to be able to give some remarks uh, before we go for a, a short break and then resume uh, for a more interactive session. Uh, welcome, Wangari. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mediator Sarah. And uh, once again, uh, kindly allow me to appreciate our, our facilitator, uh, that is a fellow mediator and IT consultant, Mr. William Magan of Agan and Associates, and also uh, part of the Faculty of Law at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. When we started this journey of um, developing uh, intellectual property, uh, the dispute resolution competent uh, mediators. Um, Mr. Gan was gracious to be able to join with us. Uh, now that he is an expert um, in this field and we are really, really grateful. I'm looking forward to the next part um, after we have had the break 
when we will be having the general discussion, being able to also run through some of the queries or questions um, that colleagues have uh, put forward and also just uh, discussing some of the development agenda. The interest of having uh, intellectual property dispute resolution uh, competent mediators is because the intellectual property discussion is really about entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is a very powerful tool for development. Uh, one of the areas that we stand for, because we stand for um, enriching lives, enriching communities, enriching uh, families, enriching nations, and also enriching businesses. And so this really falls in very uh, well with uh, the, uh, the mission that we are in of um, enriching lives. For the colleagues who are taking the World Intellectual Property General course in intellectual property, and the exam is uh, scheduled for September 20th to 21st, we really are delighted that this uh, tutorial have uh, been a good support to you, just as they've been a good support to um, also the uh, part of the uh, associates who are taking um, this particular course. And uh, we do not close this journey here because for us, the vision that we have is that we are actually able to have um, a pool of mediators from which institutions such as the Kenya Intellectual uh, Property Institute, institutions such as the Kenya Copyright Board, the Kenya Film Commission, institutions like the Judiciary, institutions such as the Attorney General's Office, and also other institutions that are in the private sector, they can be able to tap into this uh, pool of mediators who we are very clear have a good understanding of this particular sector. So if you are taking the general course in intellectual property and you're taking the exam, kindly request that by this Friday, which is um, um, tomorrow, kindly please be in touch with Mediator Sarah Ter so that we can also have uh, better planning of how the colleagues will be able to take the exam. Um, it is scheduled for September 20th to 21st and we're looking forward that everyone will graduate um, with stellar performance. So as I said earlier, the uh, mission that we are in of having intellectual property competent mediators, intellectual property dispute resolution competent mediators is really aligned to the world intellectual property uh, development agenda and we are looking forward to being able to front the colleagues after we have completed this course um, on uh, which is the introduction on uh, intellectual property. There is a follow-up course on um, the world intellectual property uh, arbitration and mediation um, it picks up, there's an overlap with, um, the, uh, with the period of the exam that uh, we are in, so we may not be able to have colleagues um, uh, register for it uh, in this particular cycle, but we are looking forward, first let's get the general course um, uh, done because it is a prerequisite for us to be able to um, take the next course. So let us get this first course done and then we can be able now as a pool of intellectual property dispute resolution competent mediators then be able to apply for the next course. So colleagues, I commend you, I thank you, and for those who are new to the call today, please feel free to reach out to what we have uh, mediators. Um, the email has been posted on the uh, chat, that is what we have media, mediators Africa, and you can be able to be part of the email listing and also the WhatsApp group to be able to receive uh, further updates. So thank you for colleagues for the time, and I'm looking forward to the next part of the discussion right after the break. Thank you, Mediator Sarah for moderating us through the um, three sessions and looking forward to the next part. Good afternoon and God bless you. Thank you, Mediator Sarah. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wangari. Uh, uh, participants, we will be able to have a, a two minute break. Uh, I request you to remain uh, signed into the call uh, during our two minute break. Uh, and then we will be able to resume. So participants, we have a two minute break just for us to be able to stretch, uh, grab some water, use the restroom, and then we will be able to come back uh, for more questions, uh, comments uh, from us who are present. Uh, so thank you very much.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening once, ag once again. Uh, welcome back uh, for the second uh, part of our final, final uh, session of this uh, three-part uh, tutorial series uh, that we have actually been having since the 27th of August. Uh, when we had the first tutorial covering the patents, the copyright, related rights and trademarks, uh, having the second tutorial on the 3rd of September, looking at geographical indications, industrial design, new plant variety protect protection, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions and genetic resources. And uh, finally today, being able to look at unfair competition as well as uh, IP and uh, development. Uh, during this uh, last uh, uh, part uh, of, of the tutorial, we will be focusing on uh, questions uh, just uh, drawn from different parts, all the way from tutorial one up to um, today, what we have covered today. And uh, we still welcome uh, more questions. Uh, you're welcome to be able to, to share your questions and comments in the chat uh, facility. Uh, welcome, Mr. Gunn. You had some water? Yes, yes, I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to have an interactive session. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I, I, I do have a few questions that have been uh, uh, put together from the different tutorial series that uh, we have had. Uh, some, of course, you have been able to cover in the comments, uh, but uh, uh, coming up again, probably should be good to be able to look at them again and be able to give some examples. Uh, so just uh, straight away uh, with the questions, uh, I'll reach out a couple of questions, two or three, uh, give you. Uh, to be able to look at, uh, uh, to respond to at a go. Uh, so uh, just uh, coming from what we have covered today, I know you have given us some very good examples just before we went for our break, uh, but just in, you know, brief uh, form, uh, could you tell us what is the contribution of IP to the economy? What is the contribution of IP to the economy? And uh, this you can be able to take uh, together with the question, how can IP be commercialized? How can IP be commercialized? Uh, so uh, perhaps you can take those two and then we will be able to proceed. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh... We have had different stages uh, historically uh, in our production. We come from what we can still remember is uh, an agrarian uh, revolution, uh, industrial revolution, uh, where different factors of production uh, came into play in different percentages. For example, there was a time in the pre-industrial era where labor is a factor of production, uh, contributed uh, perhaps to more than uh, 90%, you know, uh, in terms of factor of production. And that is the reason why uh, we had farms, for example, sugarcane farms, plantations, that uh, uh, needed uh, 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 slaves to, to work on them. You know, those are the pre-industrial uh, uh, era where knowledge was very minimalistic uh, and capital was very minimalistic. Sorry, just excuse me, this is Michael. Sorry, just excuse me one moment. No problem.
Um, Mr. Mr. Gan. Sorry, uh, my laptop is very sensitive. Sorry, sorry. Uh, where did you lose me? Uh, I, I think some uh, a little bit of. Uh, I think some uh, when you asked for a little break, then it came back, but you were muted. So okay. maybe you could just yeah go over the okay. questions again. Okay, so we also have the industrial uh, era where now we have uh, reduced labor. You know, we are we we have industrial revolution and as such we we have mechanization. Uh, uh, that now has has, has taken uh, has taken up uh, a lot of work that uh, initially uh, had to be done uh, through human labor and more capital uh, and just a bit of knowledge. Now today we are in another era. And this is something that we have to realize when we are talking about IP and economy. We are in an era that is known as the knowledge economy. And knowledge economy today is almost taking up the space that was taken up in the industrial era uh, in fact, more than the space that was taken up in the industrial era, where there was more labor, less knowledge, and uh, less capital. So today, in the knowledge economy, we have less labor, less capital, and more of knowledge. Now, that knowledge is intellectual property. In fact, we have countries that thrive and build their economies on intellectual property. Now, coming to that question, uh, intellectual property is indeed a factor of production today in the knowledge economy, and as such, protecting it encourages uh, creators protecting it then also means that creators will uh, benefit by way of uh, you know monetization having money and it also brings uh, benefit to the government the individual benefits because he is uh, paid for his intellectual property and of course the government also benefits uh, by way of taxation of that particular income. So it really uh, improves on the economy, uh, both microeconomy and macroeconomy. The second question is how uh, IP can be commercialized. Being property, we go back to that definition. It is property and as such the owner can do whatever it is that he wants to do with it the way uh, the owner of a tangible property uh, deals. So he can sell, he can hire, he can uh, lease, he can license uh, and I dare say he can also destroy his property because if, if uh, you own something I can decide to destroy my laptop, it would be nobody's business. So whatever it is that uh, an owner uh, of any other type of tangible uh, intellectual property can do, the owner of intellectual property can also do. And this includes commercialization by way of licensing uh, and licensing uh, through contracts, uh, which uh, then defines the relationship between the owner and uh, the licensee. Uh, the same can also be sold through uh, a license. You can sell your rights. In law, we talk about your rights. You know, you have a right in intellectual property, and it is that that you can actually decide to 
part with in exchange for a fee. Now, when it comes to uh, a situation where such licensing is not possible, like for example, in matters copyright, music, books uh, that are uh, photocopied left, right, and center, we have in place uh, collecting management organizations, the, the famous or uh, infamous uh, CMOs that are tasked really with collecting royalties on the behalf of the members. Uh, and where there is transparency, let me tell you, uh, the owners of such music that is played all over the place will actually and can benefit a lot uh, from the CMOs uh, because it is up upon the CMOs to, by law, come up with ways and means of uh, taking care of the monetization aspect of their members. Sarah? Okay. Uh, th thank you for those. Uh, I have a few questions uh, related to, uh, you know, just, you know, picking up from that uh, commercialization. Uh, the question is, uh, is IP regularly included in uh, accounting assets of businesses, uh, especially small and medium uh, uh, enterprises? Uh, then together with this, you could give us some examples of, uh, you know, what uh, components could be uh, considered assets, IP assets uh, within the business. Then the third question that uh, you could take that's related to this is uh, how is evaluation of IP done? Uh, for example, when you want to sell something or you want to use the same for uh, bank collateral, how, how do you arrive uh, at the value? So you could take those three kindly. Uh, you, you could take okay, those thanks. three. Yes. Uh, I think I'll start by saying, Okay, I, I, I think I, I, I'll start by very sadly uh, saying a big no. Uh, and it is an unfortunate situation because it comes out of really ignorance of, uh, uh, of IP. Most SMEs do not even know, are not even aware uh, of the intellectual property assets until it is brought out to them through what we refer to as uh, intellectual property audit. So in an intellectual property audit, an SME would uh, bring an IP lawyer or an IP consultant on board uh, and uh, you then, you know, go through what you, uh, you know, you, you identify the intellectual property assets that a particular SME has, starting from their brand, whether they are registered or not. They do not know that that itself is also an intellectual property asset. Uh, depending on what the SME does, it could have, just as we have discussed, it could have, uh, you know, confidential information as an asset. Um, which if you look at the uh, letters, uh, contracts for employment that they have between themselves and the employees, you realize that most of us do not realize that there's usually uh, uh, a clause of confidentiality. That in itself means that uh, that particular SME has certain confidential information, which uh, it leverages on to, you know, be ahead of others and which it cherishes is very, very important. Uh, again, depending on what the SME does, it could also have trade secrets, you know, 
I look at an example of uh, some of the coffee uh, chains, uh, coffee, coffee shop chains that we have in this country, especially in, in, in major cities. Why would I prefer to take coffee at, say, Savannah? Uh, why would I only want to take coffee from Art Cafe? Why would I want to take coffee only from Java? If you are keen on taste, you realize that their coffees are different and your preference would perhaps be because they, each one of them has a secret way of making their coffee uh, that makes customers prefer uh, taking coffee and that coffee comes with a premium. That is a trade secret already that adds to uh, the, the business of that particular uh, SME. One of the simplest uh, uh, simplest identifiable intellectual property is trademarks, is trademarks. And uh, when you look at certain examples uh, of, of uh, value, and perhaps I don't know whether I could also touch on that uh, valuation of, of IP and give an example of mm -hmm. valuation of, 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 of the brand. Um, I can give you a few examples, uh, but they are not current. Say Google uh, itself, talking about the brand of Google, uh, several years ago, was valued at 93.3 billion US dollars, and I'm sure that by now it is more than that. And that one is just the brand, not its cash and other assets. Coca-Cola was valued at 79.2 US. 72. 79.2 billion US dollars, and that is that is just the brand, okay? And uh, with that, really, would it be a problem for Coca-Cola to access a loan just using its brand as collateral, even without touching uh, movable property? So that itself, uh, is an example of, uh, of, of what uh, uh, asset we are talking about, okay? This, it is an asset. Patent, that grant is an asset, okay? It's an asset. Uh, you know, in accountancy, what is an asset? Uh, is, as, 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 as opposed to a liability, yeah? It's something which you own and you can actually uh, use. Um, Mr. Gan? Mr. Gan? Sorry, uh, you must have lost me temporarily. Yes, we did. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, sorry for that. No problem at all. Yes. So, so intellectual property valuation is again a very specialized area. Uh, the how I can perhaps just explain it very, very briefly, but uh, it is a very complex area. Uh, let me give the example of a brand. There are several ways uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of 
valuing a trade or a brand of a particular company, we start by assessing if, for example, that company is listed. Uh, it's a very interesting tool that most of us do not even know when you go uh, daily and you look at the stock, okay? Uh, there are several rows there and uh, for a brand value, you want to look at the, the specific tool according to the capital markets authority uh, uh, of that particular country, which is then used mathematically in a very complicated formula. Most of us actually even use a software to, you know, uh, to, to make that calculation, but the parameters would include a study of the brand in the market. That then would mean that we also bring in, uh, you know, a known, respected, well-respected company that does, uh, uh, you know, collects statistical information out there about a particular brand. And there is a manner in which they present it to us. And then we can choose on which, uh, which of, I think there are, about, there are about three or four ways of, of going about it. We can choose one of them. Uh, and once we have come up with, uh, with uh, uh, the value, we prepare a whole document. It can be a document of about, uh, say, 20, 25 pages that indicates or gives a justification. Because you don't just go and then say that this brand is valued at, you know, 79.2 billion. We indicate and we, 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 we profile the path that we have used to reach uh, that particular figure, which can be taken by the client even for second opinion, and usually uh, the difference, even if they would go to another intellectual property lawyer, the difference would not be so much. So it is something that we do as intellectual property lawyers, just the same way a valuer, when you want to purchase property, uh, the government valuer that goes to you know, take value of that particular land, uh, you know, the parameters that he uses. This, in the same, same way, we also have our parameters that we use for coming up with valuation of intellectual property uh, assets. So it's a specialized area, very, very scientific, and uh, almost, you know, accurate to, you know, it can almost accurate to the zero point something, yes. Uh, have okay. I missed out another question? Uh, no, those are covered. Uh, I, I'll just give you another set of questions to be able to go through. Uh, so the next set of questions, uh, th this is the first one. It asks, how can IP be further supported? How can IP be further supported? Uh, the other question is, uh, which are some of the effective ways of creating public awareness about IP? Which are some of the effective ways of creating public awareness about IP? And then the last one in that particular set of questions is, what is the difference between intellectual property and industrial property? What is the difference between intellectual property and industrial property? Uh, kindly take those three. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think question seven, the, the question on, uh, on, on, on how, on how uh, IP can be further supported is, has partly been, been, been discussed in uh, IP and development. And uh, I can then perhaps just give 
three or four points here. One is awareness. Eh? One is awareness. Because when people are not aware, it becomes impossible to protect IP. And why am I talking about awareness? Let me give you an example. Uh, we love basmati. Perhaps it's because of maybe my Indian background. You know? uh, and uh, who doesn't love basmati rice? And we've eaten basmati for years. My wife has made basmati for years. And recently, and for now, allow me not to identify that supermarket, but I had to actually go to that supermarket and say, you know what? I think the basmati that uh, you have sold to us is not basmati. Because my wife had gone there to complain. And uh, they said that uh, maybe she has mistaken. And she said, no, 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 I cannot, I cannot mistake, but I'm the one who cooks basmati and I know basmati. So I went there. I have an appointment with the supermarket, but I forewarned them that, uh, you know what, this is my area and uh, you really have to take up the complaint as it is, because that's the procedure. You are just a supermarket. You don't have to go out there defending suppliers. Probably, now that we are through with this tutorial, you can already guess what is going on. That there is a, that is packaging ordinary rice using basmati uh, packaging. And that is so easy, you see. Now, who will detect this? It is the consumer who understands the difference and knows their rights. Basmati is protected by GI. And it will be interesting to know how this uh, journey will be. Uh, it was very obvious that the manager was ignorant about matters IP, you know, totally ignorant. So awareness is, is, is very, very critical. Uh, the other is enforcement. We can enforce, we can help uh, support IP by enforcement. If we do not enforce IP, creatives will remain poor. Remember that the only thing that a creative has is the creative and innovative mind. We then come in and help the creative to make money by way of commercializing or monetizing his creativity. Now, if his creativity is counterfeited, his rights are in left, right, and center. Even after complaining, if enforcement is absent, this creative, and some of you may have seen some of our very, very, very talented musicians in this country literally hawking their own music on the streets. It's because there is somebody downtown that is making money off these people. Why? You've reported to the police and the police is not doing anything about it. So lack of enforcement is really, really major. Uh, the other is, uh, and this is perhaps difficult, but it is a, a, it is about having a total, total, total paradigm shift in our attitude, okay? In our attitude. In law, we say that ignorance of law is, is not a defense, okay? If you steal something, you will be punished if you're caught with it. At that point in time, you will not say that I did not know that stealing is wrong. Okay? We steal intellectual property left, right, and center, and especially copyright is pathetic. But why? It's because we have not had that shift in our minds that look here, there is somebody 
whose earning depends on my purchasing this particular product legitimately and legally. It is having that paradigm shift of allow me, I know we also have Muslims uh, as participants, allow me to use this because I'm a Christian. It's about that commandment of do unto others what you'd also expect them to do unto you. Okay? It's that space where you ask yourself, what if somebody stole my product? without, I mean, stealing is stealing. What if somebody stole my product? How would I feel? And as such, why am I doing this? Uh, so that paradigm shift, and I can give you an example. If you go to Tanzania, the Tanzanian artists are actually truly very well off. Why? It is because of the culture of the Tanzanians. A Tanzanian can never understand how he can not pay for a CD or cannot pay for a download uh, for his consumption. They, uh, uh, an ordinary Tanzanian will not understand that. If he does not have money, then he will not pay. He, uh, if he does not have money, then he will rather borrow from a neighbor who has a CD than to be convinced to do shady business. Now, that is just across the, uh, 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 you know, uh, Tanzania is just, uh, they're just our neighbors, you know, across the border, yeah? So what then happens with us? So it's important that we also interrogate that uh, paradigm uh, shift, you know, the attitude uh, that we have uh, of course, allow me to go back to awareness. This, 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 this should come very early. Perhaps our system of education should also have this from primary school, you know, from pre-graders, so that they understand uh, what, why it is important to actually uh, identify, uh, protect, and. Uh, uh, and commercialize intellectual property from that very that that very early early age. Uh, then difference between intellectual property and industrial property. Have I missed out on another one, uh, Sarah? Um, no, that, that that's it. Okay, so the yes. difference between intellectual property and industrial property, this is very, very simple, okay, please. Industrial property is a classification under intellectual property. Intellectual property is the broader, is the umbrella, below which and related rights on the one hand, and there is industrial property on the other hand. Uh, uh, and this actually is a good question because of semantics. And I should indicate this, that in our country here, we do not have an intellectual property institute. And that is why we, when you want to register an industrial property, you go to the Kenya Industrial Property Institute. When you want to register copyright, you go to the Kenya Copyright Board. When you want to register Plant breeders, right, plant breeders' rights, you go to CAFIS. But there are plans of bringing all this the way it is in many countries under one roof. And that is an institute of intellectual property. So it is very, very confusing. And it's a very good question for actually students to ask this question. Because in Kenya right now, it's confusing. Because registration of different types of intellectual property are all over the place. But I am aware that there are plans of coming up with an institute of intellectual property, even here uh, in Kenya. Back to you, Sarah, unless I've missed a question. 
Okay, uh, no, I, uh, the questions are well uh, covered. Uh, we have uh, actually run out of time. Uh, we still have uh, uh, very many questions, uh, but I'll just probably give you a final, final one for today. Uh, let me see which one I should give you. Uh, yeah, probably the final, final one is, uh, do all countries have their individual IP laws? Uh, do all countries have their individual IP laws and are there standard IP laws which are used worldwide? So uh, probably you can take that as the last question. Uh, we do have so many more that uh, remaining, which I think is indicative of uh, uh, just, uh, you know, how the interest that there is in the particular sector. But yes, go on with that, that one. Thank you. Uh, all countries, have their national intellectual property laws. Especially today, the secret here is to look at the signatories to the World Trade Organization. That is the secret. As long as a country is a signatory to the WTO agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property, uh, rights, that country will have a national intellectual property law. Now, it, sh it, it, it is important to perhaps also, because to perhaps also address that question in a different way to the questioner. That has not always been the case. Look at our country here in Kenya. We do not have uh, all IP laws before 1994. Okay, in fact, perhaps the only law that we could say we had was on trademarks, but that too uh, uh, was was a colonial was a colonial uh, law where it was not even on trademarks; it was on, on on patents. It was a colonial law where, for one to register a patent. Uh, you had to make an application and that application would first of all go to London. And if London Patent Office granted the patent, it was then, it would then be recognized in Kenya. Okay? So it has not always been the case. Now, in such a situation, one then would ask, does it then mean that parties were not protected in the absence of laws? No. You look at the international treaties and agreements and conventions. So many countries, including Kenya, for example, is a member and has always been a member of the Ban Convention. And the simplest way sometimes in explaining this is that uh, when we talk of copyright, you, if you look at our copyright law, we, took a, we, look, we talk of copyright law of, uh, of, uh, of, of 2001. The question would be, what happened before 2001? We were a banned country, and as such, all our works were automatically protected uh, by the ban convention. But post 1994, countries have national laws because intellectual property now is really territorial in as much as it is possible to write on international registration systems for convenience of registration. So the answer is yes, countries have national laws. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end of our tutorial series on intellectual property dispute resolution. Uh, today we have had the third tutorial uh, where we have been able to have a recap of the modules covered, as well as look uh, specifically at uh, unfair competition and IP and uh, development. Uh, we do have some questions which are not yet covered and uh, our facilitator, Mr. Gan, will be able to respond to these questions and uh, they will be shared in the form of a bulletin. 
uh, apart from that, ladies and gentlemen, we wish all of you who will be taking your exam on the 20th and 21st, uh, uh, all the very best as you continue to prepare uh, to sit uh, for, for, for the exam on those particular dates. Uh, we will continue to engage on this uh, particular platform on different things. Uh, we have uh, next week uh, a session that is coming up at uh, the same time, uh, two o'clock, uh, looking at uh, the finance sector and dispute resolution. Uh, so kindly uh, make that time for that uh, within your diaries. Uh, we close uh, with the words of the national anthem in English. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and good evening.